In 1507, Andreas Meinhardi composed an imaginary dialogue in which he, Meinhard, tried to convince another student, Reinhard, to study at the new University of Wittenberg. He extolled the city's fine air, easy access to the countryside, its learned professors, and the fine doctors who kept the population healthy. As they walked the streets of Wittenberg, Meinhard introduced his companion to interesting local features. Uh, as they passed by a stream, the stream known, known as the Kitus, uh, the host explained, or rather answered the question, what is the name of the quarter through which the river Kitus rushes? So Meinhard answers, it is the Jewish quarter, named from the Jews who once inhabited it, but who have now been expelled completely. Such a conversation could have taken place around 1500 in many cities of the Holy Roman Empire, Iberia, England or France, each with its ghostly remains of Jewish neighbourhoods. And in this, our final Wiles lecture, we will explore the challenges of living diversity by concentrating on the non-Christians uh, of, of Europe, uh, the Jews who lived in towns and cities, they are of course not the only group, but a group that existed in large parts of Europe for times. We will follow them as they settled and even prospered as an element of urban diversity. By tracing their experiences into the 15th century, we will also learn about the changes that affected other groups of strangers as cities applied new ideas and new technologies in the effort to monitor, discipline, contain or eradicate diversity. In Iberia, this of course finally took the form of two great expulsions of Jews and then of Muslims, and this transformed Mediterranean history forever. This transformation of the civic mood is associated with some long-term changes in European life, some noticeable already by 1300, but all palpable after the Black Death and during its long and dramatic aftermath, which Bruce Campbell has memorably called the Great Transition. Cities had lost up to half of their populations, the volume of trade fell and continued to fall. There were decades, these were decades visited and revisited by uh, disease, during which the shape of many cities changed, with large sections now vacant, buildings yielding no contribution to the urban tax base. Politics reflected the <coughs> sharp divergence of interests emerging between urban groups. And this meant uh, that guilds closed ranks, excluding newcomers and restricting membership to sons of members, uh, as in London and Venice and many other examples. In Flemish towns, which were on the whole more economically buoyant, this coincided with what, with, with what Mark Bona has called uh, institutionalisation poussée, forced institutionalisation. With enhanced protection by Duke Philip the Good, the 53 crafts of Ghent, for example, now also conducted a great deal of internal scrutiny, thus bolstering the city's activities of inclusion and exclusion. Where ethnicity was a marker of difference, this could become a new criterion for exclusion. So in Braunschweig, where people of Slavic origins habitually joined craft guilds as immigrants or an existing group generated in the city, a new regulation of 1409 excluded them and craft membership led to, and as craft membership led to citizenship, this meant a meaningful handicap. In Lüneburg, the excluded were Danes, Swedes and Norwegians. In Iberian cities, the mix which included Jews and Muslims, very intricately so, and so the Guild of Goldsmiths in Valencia forbade the teaching of the craft to any non-Christians in the early 15th century. We witness a shift of mood in what was done and said in the public domains of towns and cities. <clears throat> I don't normally speak uh, to crowds in the mid-morning on Saturday. <laughs> Body, the, settlement the settlement between what we might call church and, and state, grosso modo, which had seen rulers and urban communities tolerate and even support a certain diversity in work and lifestyle, was now tested in many and in many parts lost. Some challenging religious ideas, not so much new but vigorously now preached, gained prominence. These interpreted the common good as a new moral disposition directed at every Christian to reject the prevailing norms of business, 
based on the exchange of credit and interest, to see social activities which seemed frivolous and wasteful, like family parties and games of chance, and to promote in their place a lively Marian devotion. Long-established groups like the Beguines of Lübeck became victims of preaching campaigns against begging, as by Dominican uh, John Mulberg, and expelled from the city in 1405, when he next then turned his attention to clergy who gave loans at interest. This was a vision of an urban Christian purification, and it coincided with fantasies about the ideal city, symmetrical and free of messy humanity. Attitudes to Jews became the touchstone of this new morality and the politics associated with it. They gradually lost the places they had inhabited in the urban neighborhoods. So let us trace this transformation, a distinctive yet telling case of strangers become neighbors and then become strangers again. In some parts of Europe, Jews had long been present. Rome, the cities of Midi, of Iberia and Sicily. In these Mediterranean parts, Jews held land, lived as farmers, artisans and vine growers. The Iberian tra traveller, uh, Benjamin of Tudela, you see there some of the imagined, at least traje reported trajectories of his travels, who described a trip that began in 1165 from Saragossa through Occitania to Italy and beyond. Each city with its Jewish community describes many with famous schools and prosperous members. A new settlement pattern developed as Europe's economy grew. By the year 1000, Jews had migrated to major imperial cities. You see the cluster of imperial cities there on the right, but also uh, uh, further west, a whole sort of uh, area in northern France there of settlements in large and even smaller uh, communities. So that by the time of um, the Crusade massacres of 1096 in the Rhineland and northern France, these had become flourishing communities sometimes up to a thousand Jews in big cathedral cities like Worms or Mainz or Speyer, living under the protection of prince bishops, but also spread into smaller towns. So just look at the glimpse of a sort of penetration there by the year uh, 1300 or so. The ideology of Christian kingship allowed rulers to see non-Christians as servants to their treasuries, to their uh, enterprise of fiscal control. As Hussein Fancy has recently shown, this even meant that Christian rulers hired Muslim mercenaries to fight their own wars against other Christians. But Augustinian theology linked in particular Jewish service to the terms of toleration of their presence in Christian polities. In the concept of Jewish servitude, this presence was combined with the Roman legal concept of service to the imperial fisc, and this goes back literally to Roman imperial legislation, its treasury, the particular status of the emperor, and all that serves his ability to deliver, uh, to deliver peace and protection within the empire. By the 12th century, Jewish servitude had become a concept familiar to the Holy Roman emperors, current in England and in Sicily. It was also used in the royal statutes, the fueros, that organized urban life in Castile and Aragon, with ample sections, really, really detailed sections on the relations between Jews, Muslims and Christians and the crown uh, within these urban communities. The vastly influential fuero de Teruel, issued in 1177, said that um, the Jews are servants to the Lord the King and are always deputed to his purse, to his treasury. Supreme authority over Jews became a touchstone of royal and imperial authority as against uh, vassals and as against ecclesiastical authorities too. Kings and emperors saw the treatment of Jews as their special privilege, and they sometimes chose to allow territorial lords within their domains also to issue their own privileges and settle Jews. So the Counts of Champagne even welcomed Jews into their territories after those had been expelled from the royal territories from the Ile de France by King Philip Augustus in 1182. Duke Frederick II of Austria granted in 1244 rights which regulated settlement of Jews in Austrian cities. As servants of the ruler, Jews could hold positions of tremendous trust in services that underpinned the new economy in particular, Jews as minters, as traders and as tax collectors. 
the medieval economy was thirsty for credit. Europeans were taught to feel ambivalent about lending at profit, yet every local merchant was a creditor of sorts embedded in networks of debt. Regular and plenteous credit was required by manufacturers and artisans and by cities themselves to support big projects of public works like the building of walls, of bridges and city halls. As we have seen, rulers and autonomous polities alike invited those best suited to offer sophisticated financial services to settle in their parts. Philip Augustus, as we saw, welcomed the bankers from the city of Asti in the Piedmont to provide credit in the capital Paris. In the following century, King Bela, as we saw, welcomed to Hungary immigration of Christians and Jews from Austria, Bohemia and other foreign parts. Dynasts often granted privileges to Jews together with other groups. Italian bankers, German merchants, Emperor Charles IV treated his relations to Jews and Cahorsin, that's a sort of general name really, for, for, uh, for foreign bankers, as a regalian right, as a right related to his own imperial status. All Cahorsin usurers and Jews under and of the empire are servants of the imperial treasury, he stated. Similarly, and earlier in 1291, Andrew III, King of Hungary, granted a set of privileges for Posoni Pressburg, addressing first the settlement of any newcomer and that of Jews. So it's linked up with the vision of settlement and urban development. And if any person from whatever town um, wishes to come to the city of Posoni for the purpose of, self, of settling, the lord of that town or possession will not presume to impede this, but will allow him to hold his goods freely. A just and customary land tax should be paid. Also, the Jews settled in that city have the same freedom that uh, citizens do, saving the right of the Archbishop of Estergom and the Provost who presides in Posoni. These bankers and merchants came from regions with more highly monetized and urbanized economies, and they formed professional diasporas across Europe and sometimes beyond. Their operations were facilitated by the trust arising from the kinship groups of these uh, groups of strange, by the, by the kinship networks of these groups of strangers, and enhanced sometimes by religion or regional identities, just like later in later centuries the great Quaker bankers of the 18th century were. At the very same time, intellectuals, often in cities and soon within universities, developed new genres for discussion of Jews and Judaism in disputations both imagined and real, where the biblical Jew and the Jew next door met, clashed and confused Christians. By the 13th century, polemic was staged on city streets, often by kings who involved leading theologians, as in Paris in 1240 and in Barcelona in 1263, but also amongst merchants and in the vernacular, like the uh, Mallorca disputation of 1286. New anti-Jewish narratives were born, child murder, host desecration, later poisoning of wells, and although there were only, these were only rarely enacted, definitely the first two, child murder and host desecration, they were only rarely enacted and enacted successfully. They now formed part of uh, knowledge about Jews that was out there. Occasional persecutions by irregular trials or murder in the streets followed well-told and situated claims, like the child murder accusation in Lincoln in 1255 or in Oberwesel in 1287, or the regional Rindfleisch massacres in Franconia throughout the months of the summer of 1298 prompted and justified by the rumour of host desecration. When the same accusation was made in 1290, that is an accusation of host desecration, against a Jew in, um, in well-governed, highly governed Paris, the consequence was not violence out of control, but rather a trial of one man and his execution. Jewish liturgy included a prayer, and still does, for the well-being of the sovereign, mentioned already from in late antiquity, Tfilah Lishlom Malchut. Rabbis explained it was necessary always to pray for the well-being of the king, for without the fear of him, man would swallow up his fellow man. The prayer acknowledged the Jews' dependence on rulers, rulers who were often capricious and always voracious, for their implementation in so many parts of Europe, for their relative safety, and for the opportunities to work and prosper. Perhaps more than any other group of strangers, but not unlike them, 
Jews were aware of their identity and were reminded of it in the course of the Christian liturgical year. Some, no doubt, felt the burden of this life as Jew to be too much and converted to Christianity. Like other groups with skills to offer, Jews sought out opportunities for migration and settlement. The Jews of Rome branched out into the Marche, Tuscany and Umbria in the 13th century, joining forces with other Jews or with other foreign bankers to provide credit, as we saw in the second lecture in the case of Ascoli in 1297. They also responded to political change. Under the heavy taxation, harassment and pressure to convert that developed uh, in England under uh, King Henry III, which means most of the 13th century, many Jews moved to other parts of the Angevin domain, away from England into Gascony, particularly in the 1260s, where the pressure was less acute. When the region of the Kersi came under the lordship of the King of England in, the tr in a treaty of 1263, or following that, Isaac, a Jew of Bordeaux, approached Pons, lord of the Bourg of Gourdon, which you saw yesterday, with a request to settle there. The resulting charter accorded costumes and establishments, rules, to those Jews, men and women, for settlement in Gourdon. They were to come and trade like any other Gourdonnais in the town and in the lord's territory around it. The Jews were to provide credit so several clauses dealt with the keeping and sale of pawned objects, excluding those prohibited, like chalices and vestments, skins from illegal slaughter, bloody clothes and plowshares. Finally, if the Jews did not enjoy the experience of living in Gourdon, Lord Ponce promised to have them accompanied safely out of the Bourg on their departure. One of the principles of cohabitation with Jews was that they be denied any direct authority over Christians. This was, of course, never fully respected in reality, as Jews employed Christian servants and held senior positions in royal administration in Iberia, as well as in business partnerships. But it did mean that Jews were not welcome within the administrative and judicial, the civic, spheres of urban life. Yet many, well, we have many examples of Jews who nonetheless played active uh, uh, parts in urban life, uh, you can imagine they're highly, those highly affluent and highly skilled had a lot to offer. And even in the records of Siena, I found here and there uh, mentions in uh, as members of the, uh, one member of the local council and two as members of the local militia in the 13th century. We witness medieval chroniclers and legislators struggle for a suitable term to describe this type of uh, positioning of like utter embeddedness of the Jews uh, without full enfranchisement. Alfred Haverkamp, the great uh, scholar of the Jews in the empire, has described the deep integration of Jews within the legal and civic cultures of German cities to the extent that Jewish leaders were addressed as magistratus et universitas, judeorum, so there's a sort of structure of community that's recognized and there's always a top Jew who represents them. Jews were occasionally described as conquives, which is fellow citizens, it's not quite citizens, but it is citizen, citizens along other citizens. It's actually quite tricky to translate. A Jewish representative was often elected, a judex, a judge of the Jews, judex judeorum, who helped supervise Jewish financial business in the city and to communicate with local authorities. In Styria, he was called Zeichmeister, which is interesting because that means really basically guild masters. If the Jews represent a certain corporation, like a guild. In Manosque, uh, again in southern France, with deep uh, settlement, they were so deeply embedded in business life that they offered um, witness statements for Christians and provided about a third of um, uh, the city's doctors, and that is very true for the cities in that region in general. The labyrinth of urban tenure meant that no neighborhood was truly ever just homogenous, uh, but in Iberian towns, the settlement patterns were particularly intertwined and intricate. A survey of the town of Avila of 1306 is full of telling details of neighborhood proximities, making this clear. In the quarter of Saint Tome, for example, this is a fantastic list one can just work through. In the quarter of Saint Tome, just to give you a good example, the carpenter Martin Diaz, whose house, not surprisingly, had fine wooden doors, was neighbor to the doctor John, the painter Abdallah, and the Jew Abraham. On a street in another neighborhood, 
the house of a Christian woman, Athenar Jimeno, abutted on that of the Jew Yusuf Davila. Indeed, she reported that water from Yusuf's roof trickled onto hers, and it should not, e non debe icaer. Her husband is named as sharing a courtyard, a corral, with the Jew Jacob and the widow of Santius Munoz. Such patterns of neighborhood led to the intricate forms of violence and litigation, of course, which David Nirenberg has studied so well for the cities of the Crown of Aragon. There was no separation, there was close neighborhood, yet there was also awareness of who was who, all at the same time. Non-Christians lived difference in proximity to Christians, usually safe and yet aware of the boundaries around comportment and management of body, of appropriate and inappropriate gestures of intimacy, of sharing of food, even in the infliction of sound upon each other. All this blended into a quality of tentative but intimate familiarity. It was an arrangement both fragile and enduring. Such proximity resulted not only in neighborliness, as we saw yesterday between the women of Gourdon, who, uh, who gave, um, who gave uh, testimony for a Jewish neighbor, but also in transgressive intimacy. A vast literature developed in Iberia, ranging from rabbinic legal opinions to elegant verse in all the local vernaculars, reflecting on sexual, sexual fascination between Jews, Muslims, and Christians. A 14th century Christian poet expressed the male sensibility towards a Jewish woman so beautiful, gentle Jewess. When I met you the day before yesterday, I experienced a glory which cannot be described. My lady, I trust your discretion and hope you will return what you have taken from me, my heart. And he goes on also to describe, you know, it would, really wouldn't do. Ideally, I would convert, but then it, it's just not, not realistic that convert in order to have her. In the more mundane records of lo local courts, Jewish men appear habitually as sexual partners of Christian women. Guillelma, a married woman of Manosk, was accused of adultery in the early 14th century. Davidono was named, and many other men, et pluribus hominibus. It is hard to judge the truth in this matter, a woman having sex or just a woman consulting with a Jew for business, but such transgression preyed on the minds of contemporaries. Jews, and in Christian Iberia and parts of Sicily, Muslims too, were inhabitants of these working urban communities. It was their home. They paid taxes and some extra taxes. They attended some civic rituals. They settled in streets dedicated to a trade, as all occupational groups did. They dressed like others and occupied homes built of the same fabric, the rich sumptuously and the poor much less so. When they chose to commission expensive books or build a synagogue, they turned to local craftsmen and artists and guided them to use well-established and fashionable patterns. So just to show you two absolutely glorious um, um, illuminated manuscripts, the Haggadah, very famous bird's head Haggadah, but also the architecture there of synagogues. On the left it's um, in Prague and on the right it's in Toledo. <coughs> And they did all of this, that is, um, use and, and enjoy and benefit from and commission local taste and art and architecture, despite the fact that around them, in the same, with the same skill of representation, were texts and performances supported by important urban institutions like cathedrals and friaries, which portrayed them, Jews, as evil, dangerous, responsible for the violence that underpinned the Christian story, the Passion. The long 14th century saw a series of changes which threatened the fragile security of towns. The Great Famine at the beginning of the century showed how quickly city streets could be filled with hungry migrants. It also allowed blame to develop around strangers and other dangerous groups. A sophisticated community, or even a sophisticated community like Carcassonne, appealed to the King of France around 1320 with a whole list of grievances and complaints which they uh, hoped that royal officials could help reverse. 
in those hard times, Judeorum voracitas, the, vor the voraciousness of Jews plague the poor, complained the city. A recent accusation that Jews abuse the Eucharist was also cited as another enormity uh, which added to the misery of the local population. The next paragraph then describes the libidinal desires of lepers who wish to seize the properties of the healthy and infect them with their own disease, with poisons and pestiferous potions and, uh, and magic sortileges. You see this in this one paragraph, you can get all these types of dangers from Jews to lepers combined together. The state of public distress and violent outrage was even more pronounced in the course and aftermath of the Black Death, as we mentioned at the beginning of this lecture and as we've raised in previous lectures. The world was turned upside down. In the short term, rulers attempted to retain the status quo, to stabilize prices and wages, but with little success. In hundreds of cities across Europe, Really, um, mostly in, uh, obviously, in, this is mostly now uh, for the Jews, a central and uh, sort of middle and central East Europe, because that's where they were actually living by their time due to previous expulsions from further west. But the Jewish communities, hundreds of Jewish communities were literally destroyed, particularly in the empire, in the aftermath, in the actual in the years and the immediate following years of the Black Death either because of literally killing or because uh, the violence caused, displa caused displacement. Pope Clement VI tried to shore up the terms by which Jews had traditionally settled with, amongst Christians, as we've seen over the earlier centuries, issuing several letters in 1348, the year of the plague, desperately reminding the clergy, those in a position to affect public opinion, one would hope, that our Saviour chose to be born of the Jewish stock when he put on mortal flesh for the salvation of the human race. In a later bull, he tried common sense, reminding people that the same plague, uh, by the hidden judgment of God, has actually afflicted Jews themselves and many other races who have never lived amongst Jews. The stark demographic change now favored workers over employers and threatened the carefully crafted urban hierarchies in the spheres of work, family and politics. Politics and local government reacted with contradictory policies and impulses, legislation to fix prices but paying higher wages, control of access to work in cities and lavish granting of privileges aimed at attracting migrants to underpopulated urban centres. Activities which had drawn stranger communities, commerce, finance above all, were now denigrated in the public sphere. Their practitioners, Jews and Lombards, humiliated and disbarred. Civic leaders invested great efforts not only in cleaning their communities, literally with all sorts of, of new initiatives in urban hygiene, but also in purifying them. A radical discourse of difference developed and it resulted in heightened judgment, distinction and separation within urban communities. While many groups were affected by this change of mood, one group failed the test of purity and probity most spectacularly, and these were Europe's Jews. Being a Jew never went totally unnoticed, even when and where Jews flourished. Marks of Jewishness, what Freud called the narcissism of small differences, could be irksome, even when not terribly dangerous. Consider the distinction revealed by a list of property owners in the Hungarian city of Sopron, Sopron, compiled in 1392. Among 110 recorded owners, there were 10 Jewish owners, that's just under 10%, and they held, held 11 plots of land. Now the local custom in Sopron was that every holder of property in the town was also eligible to a sort of allotment, you'll see at the edge of the town, this little allotment, which was for the growing of the staple <coughs> of cabbages, we might call it a cabbage patch. But um, as you'll see there, the list also hastens to add that only the Jews' houses will not have a cabbage patch. Through such marks of distinction, through their languages and habits, other groups too, like the Genovese in Seville or the Florentines in Venice, were recognizable as both local and strange. The terms of their difference were both assigned to them and espoused by them as aspects of identity. Being an ethnic stranger was a way of life many accepted, of choice and of necessity. 
the terms on which it related to the body politic were historically changeable, even volatile. And this was a time of change. In public discourse, a sharp reforming language was developed by intellectuals, university-educated preachers very often, who proclaimed a new moral order. Popes had supported the arrangements over centuries which tolerated Jews within Christian communities, but now they were forced to rethink, to oversee to some extent, the revision of traditional positions on the business and practices of Jews. Pope Martin V, enmeshed in intensive conciliar activity from the Council of Constance between 1414 and 1418, nonetheless was also busy licensing extravagant preaching itineraries across Europe by new types of charismatic preachers like Vincent Ferrer and Bernardino da Siena. Yet in 1418 he also renewed the privileges accorded to the Jews of the Empire at the request of King Sigismund, and these protected and, and these also protected, they not only protected Jewish settlement, but they also still protected, as was traditionally the case, those Christians who rented houses to Jews and confirmed that the emperor alone had legal authority over Jews. And this was a line increasingly hard to hold. In 1419, indeed, a new Secret Judaeus Bull, a new bull that laid out the basic principles for the uh, uh, settlement of Jews, the toleration of Jews within Christian society, reinforced the need to apply distinguishing markings on Jews, a requirement that actually had been around since the early 13th century, but which was applied extremely patchily. Such initiatives challenged cities and polities to discuss and reevaluate their attitudes to strangers, especially to those involved in money lending, large and small. In his interesting recent research, Rowan Dorin, whom I discovered is a student of Dan Smale, um, discusses the canon which was on the books since 1274, since the Council of Lyon, Usurarum Voraginem. This canon aimed to discourage support for Christian, mostly Italian, moneylenders as these spread throughout the 13th century, particularly north of the Alps, by excommunicating those who rented houses to them. But now, in the early 15th century, this canon was being increasingly reevaluated, reinterpreted, and applied to Jewish moneylenders too, against custom. At the same time, other long-standing arrangements which were being radically questioned. And so, in Mainz, for example, a city already mentioned for the antiquity of Jewish settlement there and the flourishing of those communities, in 1438 to 44, the Dominican Zifridus Piscato wrote a tract which considered the question, may a bishop tolerate Jews? In clear challenge to the current Archbishop of Mainz and his predecessors, Piscator's answer was no, after a lengthy discussion. This was a contribution to a local argument, indeed, between the council and the bishops and the local chapter on lending at interest, but it was also a sign of prevailing civic debates, debates throughout Europe. In those parts of Europe where Jews still lived, kingdoms and communities had to decide how to treat them in the face of a changing quality of life and tone of public discourse. Several northern and central European uh, Italian cities, sorry, Italian cities in the 1420s handed their public spaces over to the charismatic preacher Bernardino da Siena, son of the local Abizeschi family. Brescia, Verona, Massa, Maritima, all legislated under his influence. In Perugia, his preaching was enacted as articles in the law code against blasphemy, against games of chance, against usury. Public displays of virtue and devotional emotion saw what Gabor Klonitzai has called bonfires of the vanities, the burning, the public burning of wigs and gaming cubes and everything that attached to the superfluity and, and, uh, and uh, sinful lives that the citizens were called to reject. And what was, in its, was, was come, to come in its place was a fervent Marian devotion. In Modena, Bernardino's preaching lasted for three or four hours and he had people burn about 116 game boards, a bag of cards, dice and gambling tools which were also burned in the piazza of Modena on December the 5th because the saint had wanted it. On the 10th of that month he had people burn about 2,000 pamphlets of every kind and more than a sack of women's 
hair and trinkets. Deliberation on the bonum commune, which we discussed already in the first lecture, now emphasized moral difference, appearance, and conformity in a population enlisted and excited by, purify, by a purifying vision. As the expert on Franciscan economic thought, Giacomo Todeschini has put it for, in the case of Bernardino, his work and his action now came to assume all the force of a political and governmental project. In Siena, then, whose Jewish uh, community was attested by Benjamin of Tudela in 1165, a deep ambivalence guided civic life, where population had fallen from 42,000 or so to 14,000 in the later 14th century. It's pretty dramatic. In May 1384, Siena's general council decided that, knowing uh, that Jews disparage the, uh, the faith of Christ and the most glorious Virgin Mary, and so some wise men, lovers of the faith of Christ and of the honor of the glorious and most blessed Virgin Mary and of the good present, and of the good present state uh, and honor of the people of the commune of Siena, have provided that no Jew be able to stay or reside in any house or palace which abuts on the campo of the city of Siena, nor in any house or palace which abuts on the road or street which goes from the Punta San Marco to the Croce al Travaglio. So that's basically the current uh, Vita di, uh, Via di Città that I'm sure many of you have visited and you'll see it uh, just evoked over there. In 1425, Siena legislated for the wearing of a Jewish badge, yellow and highly visible. Each and every Jew, both men and women, of whatever age they be, those who are, will be, and will come in the future, will wear a big and ample O of the roundness indicated below and of crocus colored, that is yellow, cloth and was to be worn on the outer garment, absolutely visible. And lest people wear something too small to be noticed, the notary actually drew, this is one of those moments in the archives, actually drew a circle at the bottom of the page, that's 11 centimeters across, right, uh, to show the appropriate size, so never, no, nobody get away with a tiny little sort of logo thing. It was a particularly humiliating sign since only a few years earlier, the city's prostitutes were required to wear just that. In 1429, Jews, just, that is uh, four years later, the Jews were allowed to enjoy their festivals, was there any doubt, but refrained from work on Christian feast days. That the said Jews must abstain on Sundays at Easter and on the feasts of Our Lady and of all the apostles from any lending or public business and must keep their shops locked without any exception. Bernardino taught a visceral message against Jewish money lending, and as in this uh, Lent sermon that I'll uh, cite now, which was delivered uh, in 1430, just a year after the previous initiative, where he likened usury's effect to one of a sort of debilitating anemia, I would say. And if so it's the, the phenomenon of Jews, money concentrating in the hands of Jews, and if this reduction in wealth to few is dangerous to the state of the city and much greater dangers threaten than much greater dangers threaten when it returns to and wealth and money are united in the hands of the Jews. Because then the natural heat of the city, so this is turning directly to the language of medicine, because then the natural heat of the city, which can be said to be its wealth, does not reach the heart nor support it but by a poisonous flux runs to an ulcer, since all the Jews, and especially money, money lenders, are the greatest enemies of Christians. So just as a doctor will analyze the health of a body through the healthy circulation of hot and well-nourished blood, here again Beranino uses that in describing what happens when you have the sickly aberration of money being in the hands of Jews and therefore not enough to circulate and to reach the heart of the Christian polity. The Jews were a threat to the body as they were to the body politic, to the civic community. Everything about them was dissimulation and danger. What could be more different and dangerous to the true spiritual wealth of Christians? And bear here again with the syntax, which is a bit convoluted, but I like to keep it as close as I can to his own. Spiritual wealth, that is faith and obedience to the ecclesiastical precepts with other sp spiritual treasures of true Christians, 
they do not, they, the Jews, do not cease to rape, disparage, consume, devour, and dissipate with poisoned cajolements, with refined friendships, with toxic gifts, pretended conversations, deceitful thoughts, and acquired freedoms and favors, dragging with them to hell the unhappy souls of irrational Christians, that is, irrational Christians who do business with them, or more importantly, who tolerate their presence. Many talented mendicant preachers had preached against usury in Europe in earlier centuries, but none had such full access to the making of the civic mood as the new type of preacher. The observant branches of the Dominicans and Franciscans left their traditional brothers, the conventional Franciscans, for example, well behind, eclipsed them in recruitment and political influence in Italy, Bohemia, Aragon, and, other, and parts of the empire. Their vision of a new business ethic was based on a revolution in the provision of credit through a new type of bank, the Monte di Pietà, literally the sort of bank of mercy or something of the kind, not to be too literal. The Monte was a charitable bank underwritten by the city's wealthy now, and tens of cities took up the call between the mid-15th century and the early 16th all across northern and central Italy. The idea was that by aiding the poor with subsistence loans now from this new Christian uh, interest-free um, bank would mean that um, the Jews could be expelled because they would not be needed, they would not have to be tolerated. An interesting political alliance was created out of the intense preaching in Urbino and the creation of a monte such as that there. The local duke, Federico da Montefeltre, signed the foundation order in 1468 for a Monte di Pietà, which would be underpinned by the local elite gathered in their top confraternity, which was the confraternity of Corpus Domini. And it was all uh, inspired by the preaching of the uh, friar Domenico da Leonessa. The confraternity commissioned in order at this moment of self-presentation uh, to its community and uh, in the chapel where they gathered to do their devotions, they commissioned um, a painting from a fashionable uh, Flemish artist who was in Italy at the time, Justus van Ghent, and uh, represented, of course, uh, an image of impeccable orthodoxy, that is, the institution of the Eucharist, as it were, at the Last Supper. But they also commissioned... Uh, a, a, a more local painter, that is Paolo Uccello, to create a predella, that is an accompanying small panel. I'm sorry, it's not a very good image, but just I've just brought it just to show you how it's situated right under the, uh, the altarpiece here, obviously in the context of a museum, not of the original chapel. And that predella, that long lower uh, layer, uh, tells the story of host desecration, allegedly in 1290 Paris, as recounted by the Florentine historian Villani. And it tells the scene there of a woman uh, in debt to a Jew handing over the host. I think you can all see the little white Eucharistic host there handing over. The Jew abuses it in his house and causes the host to bleed. Christians break the door down and arrest the family. The host is now brought to a chapel as a precious relic and ultimately the Jewish family is burned. The discourse on credit inspired fear of contagion and disease in the words and gestures of talented preachers. The next generation in mid-century, like Antonio of, Antonino of Florence, Bernardino da Feltre, and Giovanni da Capistrano, developed sermons which targeted social behavior pointedly. They criticized the sartorial habits of women again, of bourgeois families and their preparations of trousseaus and marriage festivities, and crucially still, the ethics of business. Capistrano was licensed to preach from Italy through the empire against all evils he found on his way. Jews, heretics, Hussites. In tens of cities in the empire, such preaching provided urban elites with the confidence that emboldened them to seek out accusation against local Jews and so force emperors to acquiesce with their expulsions. This is in tens of cities. This discourse of the virtuous city caused the reversal of imperial policies that were centuries old. During the same debates in Iberia, there was the interweaving of dynastic strife, discontent with royal officials, and a sharpening of attitudes to Jews through the public discourse delivered by preachers. Disorder 
disorder worried local authorities and they tried to contain it with uh, a whole series, and these are very, very common, of local ordinances to warn people against harassing Jews. Just like this one from Tortosa in 1369, just an example that they have established an order that no person of whatever status or condition should throw stones by hand or with a sling, nor in any other manner, nor throw stones at the said Jews, nor at the Jewry or, um, of the said city, nor at its walls, nor enter that Jewry to do ill. In tens of cities in the kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, Mallorca, uh, nonetheless, uh, Jewish communities were all but destroyed in 1391, and the number of 100,000 cases of conversion is probably not one of those medieval numbers that are exaggerated. Violence began in Seville during a royal minority, just before Holy Week, that's March 1391, and by all accounts with an attack on the city's Jews, inspired by the local archdeacon and fiery preacher Fernán Martín, a new ethic a new ethnic group was born out of these mass conversions and, um, it, uh, and it disturbed both Jews and Christians. This is the category of the new Christian, the Christian convert under the pressure of mass violence, conversos. Cities long organized by trade and by ethnicity were now confused spaces of admixture. Laws followed in the next decades to keep conversos away from the urban and rural offices, and as David Nirenberg has shown, aversion to marriage with families of new Christians or anyone related to them, even if they were still Jews, developed amongst Jews as well as amongst Christians, that is, towards those new Christians. Cautious arrangements crafted in earlier decades underwent new civic scrutiny and were found wanting. Remy Constable, again, has analyzed the use of urban baths in Iberian cities shared in the 14th century or until about the mid of the 14th century by Jews, Muslims and Christians according to an established rota that separated by religion and by sex. But following the mass violence of 1391, such, even such long-standing social practices were no longer sustainable. Bathing became a suspect sign of laxity, of residual Jewishness, and for bath keepers and women, a dangerous zone of lascivious activity. 1391 set the tone for the next century, one of suspicion that in every Christian lurked a dangerous stranger, a converso. The social ill played out in cities which were supervised by ambitious and active monarchs saw the gradual reversal of policy and the reallocation of space. No longer the fuerros, which managed diversity, but now the intrusion of the Inquisition, introduced in 1478. And in Bohemia, which I admit is an area I know uh, less well, but I intend to find out more about, nonetheless it struck me that it had its own portion of quite similar uh, uh, crises in the 15th century, with war over religious and ethnic identities fought across its countryside and pointedly through sieges of its cities. The threat of the regional heresy in the form of Hussitism, Christianity as inspired by Czech theologian and religious leader Jan Hus, and uh, communicated to uh, also with the use of the uh, Czech language, prompted Catholic cities, non-Hussite cities, to welcome Orthodox bishops and charismatic preachers in order to hope and reverse this trend. Utraquis, Czech-speaking citizens, were uh, imprisoned and executed in Olomouc, Moravia's leading city, in the 1440s. The agitation also affected other tolerated groups, such as the city's well-established <coughs> Jewish community. The 1450s saw the preaching visits of Giovanni da Capistrano with his message of renewal through purification and reform, and the urban population responded with accusations against Jews. These led to show trials and expulsion from Wrocław in 1453 and Brno and Olomouc and Znojmo in 1454. We are almost at the end of our exploration, and what have we learned? Religious difference was a barrier to full integration into the civic life of Christian Europe. But there were lives to be lived in that difference. And this is true of other types of strangeness too. Flemings in London, Tuscans in Avignon, Trevisians in Venice, or Swedes in Lübeck. Living in difference was also a choice, not just a condition delivered by authorities. And it allowed people to migrate, to prosper, to enjoy positions of privilege, 
thanks to their professional expertise and labor, while also retaining contacts with other places and other traditions that they held dear. For Jews, it had, it had some added markings, more or less shaming, like the absence of a cabbage, pa cabbage patch in Chopron, or more uh, insidiously, the enforced self-adornment of uh, Tuscan Jewish women with their gaudy loop earrings. This meant life with diversity as diversity, and this was also life with vulnerability. Vulnerability was inherent to the lives of strangers who inhabited occupational niches, bankers, merchants, <coughs> doctors, and so they created communities of identity, influence, and mutual support, like the Germans in their Fondaco in, uh, in Venice, organized for mutual support, but also for almost diplomatic relations with, with the government of Venice, for the Flemings in London and the Jews in their communities everywhere. The visibility of such strangers put them at, time, uh, put them at risk at times of political strife and economic competition, as was the case for French aliens in England throughout the 14th and 15th centuries of the, the, the Hundred Years' War. Similarly, periods of religious revival that targeted wealth and distinct, distinctive social practices threatened such groups. Those who assumed the identity of locals, who, as it were, assumed the virtue of being local, from craft masters to sometimes poor and actually disorganized and unprivileged people in the city, could be animated to move against neighbors, unless the countervailing power of law and sense prevailed. The urban sense of purpose in the period of growth enabled a certain latitude in the incorporation of forenses from nearby, as well as those strangers whom moralists disdained but civic leaders considered valuable to their local communities. But a shift is evident in all these attitudes once the sense of opportunity was weakened, identities in the city became even more competitive, and many shrill voices encouraged thinking that was exclusionary, and so the tool of expulsion was more frequently used towards the end of our period. The question now pressed, what duty did the city have to its inhabitants in their diversity and to those beyond its gates? And it's the question that would become even harder to answer in the following decades, as Europeans conquered lands and encountered new strangers in Africa, Asia, and America. <coughs> this was a century when that Christian cohesion, which defined so much of European life, was also forever gone. Questions of social obligation arose acutely for example, when a poor law was introduced by Emperor Charles V to his Habsburg domains. In Ypres, in 1531, the local Dominicans responded swiftly and in contention against these new laws, which prohibited begging. Of course, that matters a great deal to mendicant preachers. And so was bound to, so claimed the Dominicans, to be uh, to target, perforce to target those peaceful migrants who should be received as a prophet to the city. It's so easy to think of a migrant as a beggar, as a distract, detractor. At the same time, Flemish humanist Christianus Kellarius defended the reception of refugees from natural disasters and war, and of course in the Low Countries that meant inundation. He talks a lot about victims of, 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 of floods. Rather than chastise such people and send them away, he recommended that when a poor woman begs at your door, you say, so he asks of this rhetorical question, do you want all these to go back to their country? Where should that miserable woman go? Her country is flooded, as it were. So he, rather, I do not command you to go back to your own country, woman, since you have none. I would rather encourage you, if you can find food, by manual labor. The discourse on beggars which guided royal imperial action here in the early 16th century is very much in the tradition that developed in the 15th and was perfected at the University of Salamanca. No foreign beggars to be supported. Pilgrims should not stray from the pilgrimage route exactly. Only examined and confessed beggars should be helped and respectable poor were to be treated in hospitals. 
looking back at our period from 1601, when he wrote the play, I must say the little known play, The Book of Sir Thomas More, William Shakespeare imagined Thomas More's thoughts as he witnessed the bloody riots against foreigners which broke out in London on May Day 1517. And these are More's thoughts, as it were. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs and their poor luggage, plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silent by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed, what had you got? I'll tell you, you had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail, how order should be quelled and by this pattern, not one of you should live an aged man, for other ruffians as their fancies wrought, with self-same hands, self-reasons, and self-right, would shock on you, and men like ravenous fishes would feed on one another. Our care for strangers, through good times and hard, is a form of self-making, and it is more. For what we do to strangers can become our own worst nightmare. Thank you very much.